Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the opportunity to once again gather together as a body, as a family, as a fellowship to open your word. Father, we would pray that your word would indeed be open to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we'd also ask you to open our hearts and minds that we might behold those things that you've placed here for our learning, that we indeed, through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, have our hope in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Yeah, you think okay. uh, we finished Numbers 5 last time, right? Are we together? I think that's right. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. So we're in number 6. Um, we've been talking about the Levites and all that sort of thing, and Numbers uh, 5 and 6, we're dealing with individual uh, separation, uh, uh, consecration. And in Numbers chapter 6, we encounter the uh, Nazarite vow. Don't confuse that with Nazarenes. They even confuse that in Matthew chapter 2, actually. But uh, Nazareth has nothing to do with the Nazarite vow. Netzer, N-A-Z-I-R, uh, is a, uh, which transliterated, is a, is a vow. And uh, so uh, let's just jump in. Um, and the word, by the way, just means one separated. Okay. Um, the Lord spoke again unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes or eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in, in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separate himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die, because the consecration of God is upon his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. And on it goes. Um, now, it's a little strange. We always associate this vow with a man, and the whole terms of the description is, of course, the man. Uh, but it's interesting, if you note the text, that a, a, a woman could also take the that's the right vow. I'm not familiar personally. I can't think of we follow a place in the Scripture where that occurs. But clearly, it was uh, the scope of this inc included the women. Um, that means they had to shave their beards, or they could not shave their beards and uh, let their hair grow. Uh, of course, I'm being facetious. Um, the uh, I'm reminded when I was in the <laughs> I don't know how these things pop into my mind. I was in the uh, uh, branch chief of the Bar Department of Guided Missiles at our Air Force Base in Colorado, and it was 59, their centennial, and uh, the uh, a lot of uh, the civilian staff were growing beards to celebrate the Colorado centennial, and. Uh, the base commander was concerned that this will all get out of hand, so he put out uh, an edict, formal Air Force edict, that uh, all members of the base would be clean-shaven, except for a neatly trimmed mustache. And to give you some insight into my mischievous nature as, an, as a branch chief of the Department of Guided Missiles, I immediately put in a requisition through the formal channels for uh, six artificial mustaches. And uh, we had, we we had the uh, I had the several of my other peer officers endorse the proper endorsement, so this went right up to the, the top. That's really a tongue-in-cheek thing. And uh, we were in this big formal staff meeting, and they covered all the real business of the missile programs and stuff. And then we got to this wreck, and uh, Colonel <laughs> looked at it, frowned. Uh, what I had done, I says that I need six artificial mustaches because I have a couple of WAFs, women, you know, Air Force, and uh, and also two uh, 
two young men who couldn't grow anything. anything. Because the way he read it, he said everybody will be clean shaven except for it. In fact, it was an edict to raise mustache. And uh, there's that split few seconds during the staff meeting when you know you're either going to get crucified for the chicanery, and he finally cracked up laughing and, and uh, uh, revised his edict. I don't know why that all popped in my mind, thinking about this, this foolishness. But, uh, no, no point to it other than you realize what a, a renegade officer I was in those days. Anyway, in this case, though, women uh, indeed um, could take a Nazarite vow. Can't give you any insight on that because I can't think of any occasions there. And most of the, the identity issues have to do with a man. Now, what's interesting here is the... This is... It, most scholars believe that this was an accommodation, not a mandate. Uh, there was, apparently, practices where well-intended people would feel they would want to take on a... Uh, very special commitment, so this accommodation was thus uh, installed, if you will. Um, it's a very dangerous practice because these kinds of commitments can often be driven by superstition, self-will, and pride. It's very, very easy for you and I, in our own ways, not necessarily with an outside vow, to, but, but to fall into a trap of taking on something that is... Uh, extraordinary, when in fact, if we really could understand our heart and motivations, they may not, uh, they may not be appropriate in the sense of being uh, a, a manifestation of self-will or pride. Perhaps the most dangerous kind of pride is the kind of pride that manifests itself in some kind of super spirituality. We need to be on the guard, uh, guard on that. That's why it's so interesting, especially uh, in, from the New Testament insights, uh, that the real commitments you make before the Lord are the clearest and cleanest if they're invisible. If you go on a fast, and we should fast, there's a whole study we could undertake about fasting. If you're interested in that, there's a number of good books in the Christian bookstore about that God's chosen fast. They do. Jesus says so. Um, but the ones that are effective are the ones that no one knows about. Putting on sackcloth and ashes and Going around grave, I'm on a fast, you know, to all your friends. I'm implying I'm more spiritual than you are. Is a is a is a is a trip of its own kind. No, that's not the kind of thing uh, uh, that God would have. Uh, uh, the things you should do should be private between you and He, and, the, and that way you're sure you're not doing it before men, but doing it before the Lord. But this Nazarite vow, in any case, is installed here. It's an accommodation. If one is going to do that, you do it this way. Um, um, and it's interesting that the symbol. Uh, 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 among the Jews uh, of the hair was the strength and we have of course when we read this we think of course of Samson he's perhaps the most graphic example uh, of one who indeed was a Nazarite that is he, he made a vow before the Lord and uh, the Lord honored that by giving him very very unusual strength and that's why when he ultimately gets uh, deceived by Delilah and so forth and and uh, she discovers that his strength is in his hair and takes a razor to his head, he loses his strength. It's not because the hair is linked to his strength. It's that that was a violation of his vow. And so God withdrew his, his, uh, his um, favor, and uh, Samson was subdued because it was of his lack of faith, in effect. And um, then, of course, as he is blinded and serves as a slave of the millstone, his hair grows back, and, of course, at that last... Uh, impulse or, or, or uh, event when he brings down the pillars of the temple of Dagon around the Philistines. Uh, God did that on that occasion, recently reinstated his strength, and you all know the story. But again, the, the, the hair, the linking of the hair uh, to the Nazarite uh, uh, um, uh, vow is best typified by uh, Samson. Um, also, in contrast, uh, this all gets to the whole image that the the, uh, 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 the unshaven man was uh, was uh, uh, very special before God's sight. And the contrast to that, of course, uh, interestingly enough, as, as Chuck has such a Chuck Smith has such a delightful way of uh, talking about it, uh, baldness is also considered a, a shame. And he used to Chuck. I loved it back, especially a few decades ago. Uh, it seems. 
when when the counterculture was the main big thing, and of course Calvary Chapel was a special haven for those for the street people that that um, turned to the Lord Jesus. But it was interesting when uh, when um, whenever Chuck would come across that place in Paul, First Corinthians eleven, where Paul mentions that for a man to have long hair is a shame, and whenever Chuck had to deal with that passage. It was always always a little tender because we had the sanctuaries filled with all these hippie, long-haired kids, and yet Chuck would not never would never duck the scripture. He hit it head on and point out that Paul points out that the, for a man to have long hair is a shame. He says, when I see these kids with the long hair, I say, what a shame. And they say, and also in the morning, when I go to comb my hair, I look in the mirror and I says, what a shame. <laughs> You know, and so he made light of it and got around that whole thing by his wit and his humor and his spirit. Uh, 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 you know, obviously blessed the ministry because we did not fall in the trap of alien. We as Calvary Chapel did not fall in the trap of alienating the, the counterculture kids and so forth. But from a scriptural point of view, Paul does make that point in First Corinthians 11. But again, in the Nazarite vow sense, uh, in that context, it was a symbol. Uh, the the, uh, the full hair, the uh, long hair, and the uh, uh, and so forth was a a, um, a mark of dedication, and uh, some scholars even associate that link that back to the unfallen state of man in Eden and all that sort of thing. But I think that's getting carried away a little bit. Now it's interesting that in the the the, the way it's instituted here is the vow and these issues are dealt with during a specific duration of the vow. If you we read this, it says all the days of the vow of the separation, verse 5, and so on. In other words, it's implied that it's for a specific duration. It's interesting, though. Uh, well, first of all, um, I was tempted when we first got into this to make a whole study of vows. But rather than do that, let me just mention something else. I know of no place in the scripture where any of us are encouraged to make a vow. In fact... Quite the contrary. Every place in the scripture that I am aware of, where someone makes a vow, it becomes the source of his undoing. And I'm going to, I would strongly, strongly admonish all of us to avoid making vows. They are not required anywhere, and they simply give Satan an opportunity. Because if you make a vow, you will stumble and break it and get on a guilt trip. The one thing the scripture does teach is if, if you do make a vow, God expects you to keep to hold it. You know, uh, we are, uh, especially as, a, as a New Testament Christians with an emphasis on the grace of God, tend to be a little cavalier. I mean, we may start off with good intentions, we fumble, we just praise God for his forgiveness and go on, and that's exact, very appropriate in, in, in many respects. But on the other hand, uh, that can cause us to be less than rigorous in our associations with a vow. I do not think that any of us are equipped, culturally or otherwise, to take a vow with the seriousness that God will attach to it from his word. I strongly encourage, that's incidentally, as an aside, just as a, I'm not speaking as a, with any authority, just a personal observation. That's what makes me nervous about our wedding ceremonies. Because it's one thing to commit one another before the Lord in marriage. And then if circumstances occur, and they do occur, where there's a separation, it's traumatic enough, interpersonally and with the family and the kids and all that, that the whole social implications and all that of, of a breakup is bad enough, setting aside the fact you're also breaking a vow before the Lord. Every time I'm in a marriage service and I hear the minister you know, tie the knot as a vow before the Lord, I get really uncomfortable because I, I don't see that uh, that's ordained anywhere. Not that the marriage shouldn't be permanent, don't misunderstand me, but the, this business of a vow makes me really nervous. And I, I strongly, setting that issue aside because I'm not an expert in that field, uh, I do encourage you all to be very, very... Um, uh, cautious or concerned if you get tempted at any time to take on a vow. There's no need to. God does not require you to make a vow, uh, and uh, but he does require you, if you make one, to keep it. So, now, having said all that, it's interesting to discover 
that the Nazarites in the scripture, and I only know of three for sure, maybe a fourth, I'll come to that. They were, the three that we know about that were Nazarites, there's two conditions. One is they were for lifetime. They were not for a duration of time, as this implies in chapter 6. They were for life. <laughs> and the vow was also committed prior to their birth. So, having said that, that just in my mind reinforces my basic attitude. Now, they were very special. Samson being one of them. Samson had a, you know, the, his parents had a supernatural visitation. In fact, when the person that visited them said, what's your name? Do you remember what the name, what the, the angel said? Wonderful. Guess who it was, huh? But in any case, that's all in Judges 13 and on, if you, if you want to dig into that. But Samson was committed prior to birth, to being a Nazarite, a, a committed to the Lord. And he grew up that way. It was his destiny. That was, his parents uh, um, established that. Samuel is another one. For Samuel 1 1. John the Baptist is yet another one. We, have, you know, we, we, we generally regard him as being a Nazarite, that is, in, under, under, under. And again, these are, uh, you know, be commitments prior to their birth. So, uh, uh, Luke 1 15 for John the Baptist. There are certain authorities that, that argue that there's some evidence that James, the brother of our Lord, was a Nazarite. In the sense that he avoided strong drink and uh, raised did not touch his head. Now, whether he was a Nazarite, that, that presumes that he was a Nazarite, not necessarily. That may have just been something he decided to do. So we don't know too much about that, and that comes from a secular authority, not from the, from the Scripture. In any case, um, uh, the idea is, is that he would touch nothing having to do with the vine, and there's, in the technicalities that we went through in verse 3, I won't belabor that, because it's clear that it's comprehensive. There's actually technical differences between vinegar of wine and vinegar of strong drink, the liquor of grapes. Those are translations of Hebrew words that are very technical and very specific, and it doesn't matter, because it also they're not to even eat moist grapes or dried, not even raisins. See, the whole idea was they just separated themselves from every, anything having to do with the vine, including their seeds and kernels and husks or anything else. That was just, just, just the the, the separation, the concept was just to leave that as a, as, a, as a symbol of their separation. The other symbol was no razor to touch his head. Um, and then the third thing was that he was, he, he was not to in any way come in contact with a dead body. And, uh, and that's probably the toughest because that can happen inadvertently. And uh, we'll talk more about that before we're through the book of Numbers. But, um, okay, and uh, verse 8, anyway, all the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. And if any man die very suddenly by him, and he hath defiled the head of his conse uh, consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day shall he save it, uh, shave it. And on the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves and two young pigeons to the priests, to the uh, door of the ta uh, tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and make an atonement for him because he sinned uh, by the dead and he shall uh, hallow his head on the same day. And he shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of the separation and he shall bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering. But the days that were before shall be lost because his separation was defiled. And this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of the separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He shall offer his offering unto the Lord one he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, and one ram without blemish for peace offerings. And a basket of unleavened bread and cakes of fine flour mixed with oil and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil and their meal offering and their drink offerings. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord and he shall offer uh, his sin offering and his burnt offering and he shall offer a ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord with a basket of unleavened bread, and the priest shall also offer his meal offering and his drink offering, and the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall take the hair of the head of his separation and put it in the fire, which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And, should the, and the priest shall take the, bo uh, the boiled shoulder of the ram and one unleavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer, and shall put them upon the hands of the Nazarite, 
after the hair of a separation is shaved, and the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And this is holy for the priest, and the uh, wave breast and heave shoulder, and after that the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite who hath vowed, and of his offering unto the Lord for a separation, beside that that his hand shall uh, get. According to uh, the vow which he vowed, so he must do after the law of his separation. So that's the Nazarite vow. I don't think any of us here, I know I, I know there's several of us here, may come close, but I don't think we're talking about uh, uh, the vow thing, so or I'll spare further comment on that. But I do want to leave you with that main insight, not the Nazarite thing. That's not an issue for us today, but I really strongly suggest that you don't undertake vows, or if you do, it's only after deep study of what a vow involves before the Lord. Okay, we get to the end of chapter 6, and there's a very familiar part here that you all know. Um, the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, In this way ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them. And here we have what is classically called the Old Testament benediction. And uh, we're obviously all familiar with it. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. How many of you have heard that before? How many of you recognize the Trinity? Ooh, we sure we did those have few, okay. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. What's the source of all blessings? Father. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. And uh, the Lord lift up his countenance. Well, incidentally, I wouldn't press it that hard, but I am fascinated that most uh, most uh, old, uh, you know uh, uh, scholars uh, have elaborate. Uh, rationale to impute into these three phrases of the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, uh, the, three, the members of the Trinity. And you're either comfortable with that or not. And if you are, praise God. And if you're not, don't make a big thing of it. But it's interesting that uh, uh, many scholars in the, in the subtlety of the actual expression see hints of the, of the Trinity in the, uh, the three lords thus expressed. And last verse, and they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. That's a heavy thing. The Lord has put his name on the nation of Israel, the children of Israel. Interesting. Okay. Um, chapter 7. Hmm. This is one of those places where I have a, uh, a difficulty because in general I think there's some value in going through every verse. You know, we generally have done that in all our studies. We sort of take it verse by verse all the way through. I hate to skip any. And yet if, we, <laughs> if we do that with chapter 7, by, we have 89 verses that are very repetitious. Uh, not sure which way to play this one. Uh, let's just dig into it a little bit and see how it goes, and then, and then maybe uh, step back a little bit. Um, before we start, uh, you know, the tabernacle in terms of its design and its fabrication, is it very, very precisely spelled out. And we went through that in Exodus. The Lord gave Moses detailed blueprints of exactly what he wanted and how it was to be built and how big and what, and, and what materials and what procedures. And that has all been done according as the Lord has specified. At the time we're talking chapter 7, that's already been done. What we're going to have here are supplemental, spontaneous, voluntary offerings by the princes of Israel as the head of each of the twelve tribes, and we're going to go. Through, we're going to discover here that there is a detailed register of offerings, very elaborate offerings, by each of the twelve princes. So there's twelve identical uh, episodes here. <coughs> but uh, uh, let's just go through it. And chapter seven, verse one came to pass on the day that Moses had fully set up the tabernacle and had anointed it and sanctified it, and all the instruments thereof, both the altar and all the vessels thereof, and had a, anointed them and sanctified them, that the princes of Israel, the heads of the house of their fathers, who were the princes of the tribes, and were over them who were numbered, offered, the, the, and they brought their offering before the Lord. Six covered wagons and twelve oxen, a wagon for two of the princes, and, e and for each one an ox, and they brought them before the tabernacle. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Take it of them, 
that they may be to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt give them unto the Levites to every man according to his service. And Moses took the wagons and the oxen and gave them unto the Levites. Two wagons and four oxen he gave unto the sons of Gershon according to their service. Uh, four wagons and eight oxen he gave to the sons of Merari according to their service under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest. But unto the sons of Kohath he gave none because the service of the sanctuary belonged to them was that they should bear upon their shoulders. Interesting. You see, there were three families, Merites, Kohathites, and Gershonites, and there were here six wagons. You mean things, you each get two, right? Two wagons and four oxen for each of the three families that remember we went through all that as to each of those had spe uh, specific commitments. It's interesting though that the Kohathites don't get any and the Gershonites got uh, twice as much. And if you recall, both the Gershonites and the Merarites carried the external covers and the external stru the structural elements. The Kohathites had the charge of the internal, we you know what might call furniture. And, uh, and they were expressly to carry it on their shoulders. And so uh, the Gershonites made out because they got the wagons and the oxen that were, you would think, if they divvied it up equally uh, among the three families. Uh, but the, but uh, that's why we shouldn't be that surprised when we see that, uh, that strange episode where uh, uh, the well-intentioned traveler was struck down when he put his hand up on the Ark of the Covenant on the wagon that David used. We talked about that. Because uh, God is very specific how he wants it done. Verse 10, and the, and the princes offered for dedicating of the altar in the day that he, it was anointed. Even the princes offered their offering before the altar. And the Lord said to Moses, they shall offer their offering, each prince on, on his day, for the dedicating of the altar. And he that offered his offering on the first day was Nashon, the son of Abinadab, the tribe of Judah, and his offering was one silver platter. The weight thereof was 130 shekels and one silver bowl of 70 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. Both of them were of the fine of fine flour mixed with oil for a meal offering, one spoon of 10 shekels of gold full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Nashon, son of Benedad. On the second day, um, we have uh, Nathaniel, the son of Zuar, the prince of Issachar, did offer. He offered for his offering one silver platter. The weight there was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels after the second sanctuary, and, and uh, both of them full of fine flour mixed with uh, oil for a meal offering, one spoon of gold of ten shekels full of incense, one bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Nathaniel, the son of Zor. And on it goes for twelve days. Each day a prince of one of the twelve tribes brings forth the offering and uh, um, Unless I missed a subtlety somewhere, I believe the offerings are essentially identical for each of the 12 tribes. The only strange thing about this, and I have no answer for the presumed problem, is that this goes on for 12 days. What about the Shabbat? What about Sabbath? And it turns out that uh, it doesn't matter. They go right through it, which, which, lays, which, which, which reinforces the principle that the Lord uses in the New Testament, that it's not unlawful to do good on the Sabbath day. And... and uh, uh, the legalism that subsequently gets introduced apparently wasn't in place here. The kind of legalism that caused the, the controversies when Jesus would do miracles on the Sabbath day. So uh, that brings us down to about uh, verse 83, because by the time we get to uh, verse 79, uh, 78, we get the 12th day with Naphtali, and we run through the same text, and, and I'll spare you uh, my clumsy reading of that same uh, repetitive styling. The main, uh, well, let's get the summary of this here in verse 84. This was the dedication of the altar in the day that it was anointed by the princes of Israel. This is verse 84. Uh, twelve platters of silver, twelve silver bowls, twelve spoons of gold, each platter weighing 130 shekels, each bowl 70, and all the silver vessels weighed 2,400 shekels. And after the shekel of the sanctuary and the golden spoons were twelve, full of incense weighing 10 shekels apiece, and the shekel of the sanctuary and all the gold of the spoons were 120 shekels and all the oxen. Uh, and so it goes. It's a summary of the whole thing. Um, 
to verse 88, all the oxen for the sacrifice of the peace offerings were 24 bullocks and rams 60 and the he goats 60 and the lambs of the first year 60. This was the dedication of the altar after it was anointed. <clears throat> and when Moses was going to the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of testimony from between the two cherubim, and he spoke unto him. Chapter 8. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, and say unto him, When thou... Oh, before, I, before we go on to chapter 8, just to summarize chapter 7, three things. Um, it's important to understand the, that these offerings were spontaneous. They were uniform. And uh, they were very particular. They weren't casual. They were very um, laid out in a Levitical, a Levitical way. Um, well, that, that's, that's it. Let's go on to chapter 8. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, and say unto him, When thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light over against the lampstand. And Aaron did so. He lighted the lamps thereof over and against the lampstand, as Lord commanded Moses. And this is the work of the lampstand. And this work of the lampstand was of beaten gold unto the shaft thereof, unto the flowers thereof, uh, was a beaten work. According to the pattern which the Lord had shown Moses, so he made the lampstand. Now, the main idea here is is that we always think of a candlestick. We think of the menorah with candles. That's today's version. But in those days, it was oil. And um, we have the main branch, and we have the six branches. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He's making claim to being, in a sense, typified by that piece of furniture in the, in the sanctuary. We call that a menorah. Uh, what is the oil a type of? Holy Spirit. Very good. And, uh, oh, am I running? You telling me my stamp paper? Thank you. <laughs> I'll just show Gilly when there's water in front of you. I mentioned I'll like one, but... Okay, thank you. I, um, um, uh, the only source of light in the, in the tabernacle was the lampstand. Those seven lights are also, emerge also in the book of Revelation when we see the throne of God. He sees a, the seven lampstands, and they're the individual lampstands, but the typology is the same. We are his light bearers. The seven lampstands in the book of Revelation are the seven churches that he writes the seven letters to. And uh, again, that's all foreshadowed here with the, the singular menorah that uh, serves in the tabernacle. Okay, uh, chapter 8, verse 5. When the Lord, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Take the, the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them. Now we're going to get into a pa uh, passage here where the, uh, the Levites themselves... Are, who have been, who've been separated from the nation and are in his special service. Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them, and thus shalt thou do unto them uh, to cleanse them. Sprinkle water purifying upon them, and let them shave all their flesh, and let them wash their clothes, and so make themselves clean. Then let them take a young bullock with its meal offering, even its fine flour mixed with oil. Another young bullock shalt thou take for a sin offering, and thou shalt bring the Levites before the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt gather the whole assembly of the children of Israel together, and thou shalt bring the Levites before the Lord, and the children of Israel shall put their hands upon the Levites. And, the Aaron, and Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord for an offering of the children of Israel, that they may execute the service of the Lord. And the Levites shall lay their hands upon the heads of the bullocks, and thou shalt offer one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for the Levites. See, the whole congregation is laying hands on the Levites, and the Levites lay their hands on the animals to be sacrificed to impute on them, in effect, you see, their, their sin. And thou shalt set the Levites before Aaron and before his sons and offer them for an offering unto the Lord. Thus shalt thou separate the Levites from among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. That's what the word sanctification really means. Set apart, separated, set aside for the Lord. And that's what they are in a very special way. And we're talking Levites here, not the priests. The priests have already been dealt with. That's a special group, subgroup. And after that shall the Levites go in to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt cleanse them and offer them for uh, an offering. 
for they are wholly given to me from among the children of Israel, instead of such as open every womb, even instead of the firstborn of the children of Israel, have I taken them unto me. For all the firstborn of the children of Israel are mine, both man and beast. On the day that I smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. And I have taken the Levites for all the firstborn of the children of Israel. And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and to his sons from among the children of Israel to do the service of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation and to make an atonement for the children of Israel that there be no plague among the children of Israel when the children of Israel come near to the sanctuary. Now, incidentally, um, without getting into all the detail, the Levitical detail, the basic idea you might notice, though, the way they're cleansed involved two steps. Part of it was done to them, and part of it they did themselves. The, it, what, the, the cleansing that came upon them was the sprinkling of the water, okay, right? The water purification. The part that they did themselves involved the shaving of their hair. And the whole idea there is to detach themselves. After they're washed with the water purification, they detach themselves um, from the habits and impurities of common life. That's what the shaving there implies. Um, the, the use of the razor, is, which is intended to describe an uncompromising disallowance of that which goes off the flesh. It's just symbolic. It's not suggesting that you're going to be any more holy if you go home and shave your legs. Nair doesn't do it. That's not the idea. It's symbolic in terms of, on the one hand, they're, wa they're, they're washed in the water of purification. That's step one. Just as you and I are washed in the washing of the word, Ephesians 4, 4, and so on. At the same time, then the next part of their cleansing is that which they do for themselves. Now, they didn't shave themselves once. You know what happens when you shave. It goes back. you got to shave again. That's what you and I need to do, is separate ourselves from those intrusions, those things that, uh, that uh, the habits and the impurities of common life. So this concept of separation implies a one-time ceremony on the one hand. On the other hand, a continuation of, of uh, recommitment, if you will. And... Uh, Let's just finish the chapter, and then we'll make an application. Um, down what? Verse 21. And the Levites were purified, and they washed their clothes, and Aaron offered them as uh, offering before the Lord. And Aaron made an atonement for them to cleanse them. And after that, went the Levites in to do the service of the tabernacle of the uh, congregation before Aaron and before his sons. And the Lord had, uh, as the Lord had commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so they unto him. And uh, the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, This is that... This is it that belongeth unto the Levites. From twenty and five years old and upward, they shall go in to wait upon the service of the, congregation, of the tabernacle of the congregation. And from the age of fifty years, they shall cease waiting upon the service thereof and shall serve no more, but shall minister, <coughs> excuse me, minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of the congregation to keep charge and shall do no service. Thus shalt thou do unto the Levites to, as touching their charge. Okay, that's the Levites. Um, you and I are obviously... Uh, on the one hand, we can look at this and learn some lessons. On the other hand, uh, we're not Levites, so that's, uh, uh, I want to make that point. On the other hand, you might turn to Romans 12.1, which if you haven't marked in your Bibles, you ought to, because this is in a sense maybe uh, at least an application of this to you and I. Romans chapter 12. Paul is writing the gospel according to Paul, so some people call the book of Romans. In chapter 12, he summarizes it all in terms of, in verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and, you know, while we look at numbers and we can learn some lessons, we can also not, shouldn't overreact. The details there are appropriate to the wilderness wanderings of Israel. But the spirit of what they were doing can be embodied in chapter, as it would apply to you and I, it would be Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Where Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now that involves several things. Involves uh, presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice. It means you were bought by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He owns you. So you recognize that and you present yourself to him. Holy. Does that mean holy that you're perfect? No. 
your, your righteousness is the Lord's, uh, Lord Jesus Christ's righteousness imputed on you. But it doesn't mean you're separate and sanctified. Acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be ye not confer conformed to this world. Now, by the way, it doesn't mean you get in a, a monastic order either. We're not, we're still in the world. That's where we bear a light. That's where we bear a witness. We are not to withdraw or hide. The monastic system is not what God called us to. But we be not, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And uh, we'll be talking more about the will of God as we go here, but that's Romans 1 and 2. If you carry anything away from the night, Romans 1 and 2 might be a, 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 a commitment of renewal for all of us. And if you haven't committed that to memory, it's a good candidate if you're into that sort of thing. Okay, we're at... Chapter 9 is a little more interesting. I don't know, but it's, it's sometimes... There are many lessons in these Levitical ordinances and, and instructions, but sometimes it is a... Uh, it isn't the most fun part of the passages. Chapter 9 is a little better. There's some interesting things in chapter 9. As you can probably tell, I'm anxious to get into the narrative later on when we start having some adventures, but uh, we'll keep grinding through. Chapter 9, verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt. So this is the anniversary. The first month, bear in mind, they restructured their calendar in Exodus. Uh, uh, I mean, at the Exodus, when they left Egypt. The, I will make, when he, when he instituted the, the Egyptian Passover, I will make that the beginning of months. Remember he said that? So the first month of their calendar is the month that they were, uh, 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 the month of the Passover, the 14th of Nisan. Nisan is the first month. So this is the first month of the second year. In other words, it's on the anniversary now of their Exodus. After they were come out of the land of Egypt. Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at its appointed season. Um, you'll hear people make the distinction of the Egyptian Passover versus Passover. What they mean by that, the Egyptian Passover was the actual event of that night when they put the blood on the doorpost and the death angel you know, and all that, and the death angel passed over Egypt. And, that, and the, 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 when they speak of Passover, it's the celebration of the Egyptian Passover. You'll hear people make that distinction. But in any case, uh, we're talking about the celebration of Passover. This is their first celebration of Passover as a commemorative event because they previously celebrated Passover by staying behind closed doors and and hearing the the moans of the death of the firstborn. I mean, it was the actual event. This is the anniversary now. Verse 2, Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at its appointed season. On the fourteenth day of this month, at evening, ye shall keep it in its appointed season. According to all the rites of it, and according to all the ceremonies thereof, ye shall keep it. Moses spoke unto the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month at evening in the wilderness of Sinai. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. And there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man that they should not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and before Aaron on that day. And these men said unto him, We are defiled by the dead body of a man. Wherefore are we kept back? that we may not offer an offering of the Lord at its appointed season among the children of Israel? That's a practical problem. Ceremonially, ceremonially, they were unclean. By the way, it's our presumption. It doesn't say this, but Mishael and Elizathan were the cousins of uh, Nadab and Abihu, who were struck dead with a strange fire from Leviticus uh, 10 and so forth. Well, when they struck dead, they were buried, right? And some scholars have figured out that that may have been the two men that are concerned here about not being able to celebrate Passover. I don't know if that, if it is, it isn't. It's just an interesting observation. But anyway, the point is, they got a practical problem. Does that mean that we're disenfranchised for the whole year? That's what they're asking. You mean I can't celebrate Passover until next year? Moses said to them, Stand still, and I will hear the Lord, uh, hear what the Lord will command concerning you. Boy, that's neat. How often we answer to the best of our knowledge, rather than say, Wait a minute, I'll go pray about it. But anyway, the Lord said unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you or your posterity, po excuse me, posterity, 
shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, or be in a journey after uh, you know far off. Um, yet he will keep the Passover unto the Lord unto the fourteenth day of the second month at evening. They shall keep it and eat with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. In other words, if you are ceremonially defiled, see, sometimes you can't help that. You're just stuck. Or also, you might be on a journey, on a trip. You know, you might be uh, uh, on an errand or something. We had no, no ability to plan it to be at Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, or be at uh, where you're supposed to celebrate Passover. Uh, then uh, uh, the provision is made that they could have their own celebration a month late, 30 days later. That's basically what we're seeing here. But um, verse 12, interesting. The next uh, three verses are provocative for you and I. They shall leave none of it unto the morning, nor break any bone of it. Now that's interesting. Here they're offering a lamb that uh, after being offered is eaten. It's part of the Passover meal. But they're not supposed to break a bone of it. What a strange, strange provision. And uh, and here we see it. And it's also in, uh, what is it, Psalm 3420 and wherever. That not a bone of it shall be broken. How interesting it is that the, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, as our Passover, when he hung on the cross, there was a Roman soldier who was under orders to break the bones of the body. I understand crucifixion was invented approximately 90 B.C. by the Romans as a form of, of uh, public execution. It was an extremely painful form of death. And it was in, that, that was why it served the Roman purpose, not only to, to, to make it both visibly a public example, it served their, their military purposes. Um, and, but the, and it's actually death by suffocation because, as, as, uh, because of the pressures hanging on the cross uh, there's eventual uh, suffocation. And the only way you relieve that is with the pressure of the feet. So if they're trying to hasten the death, because it's a very long, slow, agonizing death, one way is to wrap it up, is to break the legs of the person crucified. That was their procedure, if for whatever reason, and uh, they needed to do that. And what was, of course, the occasion here is they wanted it over with so that they wouldn't be on the hanging there the following day, because the following day was... Uh, a, 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 a Jewish high day. So the Roman centurion orders them to break the bones of the three uh, men hanging on the cross. Now, if you know anything about Roman army procedure, they followed orders. And it's interesting, if those of you might have a leaning, it's interesting to do a study of the Roman army. It's a very interesting when you when you enlisted in the Roman army you know how long your enlistment was 25 years you know that's <laughs> uh, they didn't mess around um, but the point is anyway uh, they, you know they followed orders that was the, the it was their discipline and rigor that caused them to be uh, such a successful military empire for such a long period of time but here the soldier who is supposed to break the bones does to two of them comes to Jesus Christ, he doesn't break the bones. I don't believe it was because he was rabbinically trained in the arcana of the Levitical laws of the Torah. And instead of, he, he actually violated, instead of that, he threw his spear in the side, and you know the story. But it was interesting that that impulse, that strange impulse of that soldier to do that rather than what he was ordered to do, caused the crucifixion of Christ to comply with the rules of the Passover. Not a bone of it is to be broken. Interesting how God works. It's interesting to see the subtlety of detail that God attends to. Because obviously when he's instructing Moses here, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows exactly what's going to happen on that um, dark afternoon in Jerusalem. And uh, how interesting it is that the record here in God's word ties it together so we don't mistake what's really going on. They shall leave none of it unto the morning, nor break any bone of it according to all the ordinance of the Passover. They shall keep it. But the man that is clean and that is not on a journey and forbeareth to keep the Passover, even the same soul shall be cut off from among his people because he brought not the offering of the Lord in its appointed season 
that man shall bear his sin. See, his only escape from sin was the Passover. Your escape and mine from sin is only one way, and that's by the Lamb that was offered for you and I as our Passover. If there's any other way for you and I to be reconciled before the Creator of the universe, if there's any other way, then then Christ died in vain. And his prayers in Gethsemane were not heard. Because he pleaded with the Father, if there's any other way, let's take it. Three times he prayed, and earnestly. And uh, so if there's any other way, there obviously is not, that's the point. There's no other way but to our Passover. Verse 14, if a stranger shall sojourn among you and shall keep the Passover unto the Lord according to the statute of the Passover and according to the ordinance of it, so shall he do. Ye shall have one ordinance, both for the sojourner and for him that was born in the land. Oh, that's interesting. There's only one rule here. Jew or Gentile, you got a Gentile visitor, hey, he, 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 uh, he's, there's one ordinance. There's one path for Jew and Gentile alike. That's what's hidden here behind verse 14. That's kind of interesting. All the, um, all the feasts of Moses were historically commemorative. Um, the Passover being the first, the Feast of Unleavened Bread being the second one, coterminous with it. The Feast of First Fruits, which was celebrated the morning after the Sabbath after the Passover, um, is the third Feast of Moses. Those three feasts occur in the first month of the, of the uh, ecclesiastical year. Pentecost is celebrated 50 days after Passover. Um, then we move to the seventh month of the three, three feasts are in the first month. Three, the last three are in the seventh month. And uh, uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Well, Rosh Hashanah, first of all. Uh, the, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, which is also coincidentally their new year of their, of their um, secular year. The ecclesiastical year and the secular year are different. First, the first month of the ecclesiastical year is Nizan. The first month of the the secular year is their seventh month of the ecclesiastical year. And Rosh Hashanah is actually their New Year celebration in the seventh month. But uh, in Tishri, uh, the uh, the first two days are the Rosh Hashanah, but it also is the Feast of Trumpets, which is the celebration. Of the, uh, that's the that's the fourth feast. In other words, there's three feasts in the first month, three feasts in the seventh month, and one in, the, in between called Pentecost, Feast of Pentecost. The um, uh, Rosh Hashanah is on the first of, uh, of Tishri. The Yom Kippur is on the tenth day, and five days after that, five days being the number of grace, is the Feast of Tabernacles or Feast of Booths. Those three feasts in very complex, simple, yet yeah, yeah, very uh, to oversimplify, speak of a second coming. First three of his first coming, the last three of the second coming, and between is we have the Feast of Pentecost, which interestingly enough is the feast in which it's ordained to use leavened bread, not unleavened bread. And it happens that it speaks of the church. Good to remind ourselves of that every time we get a little smug in our Christian New Testament posture. That we are the leavened bread in the whole episode. But each one of these have a historical basis. Each one are instituted in the Torah for historical reasons. Don't let that mask the fact that they also are predictive. And uh, as I said, each one of these point to Jesus Christ, some dimension of him, and each one of them are predictive. And by the way, the same thing is true of the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. It's commemorative. Paul says that thus we should show our Lord's death. Well, that's past, isn't it? Until he come. It's also predictive. And uh, there are four cups of wine in the formal Passover feast. The th- uh, I forget the, th- the names of each. The third one is the cup of blessing. It's the third cup, the cup of blessing that the Lord uses to institute the, uh, what we call the Lord's Supper. The fourth cup wasn't touched. It's incomplete. Every time the Lord appears after his resurrection, he's eating. 
by the Sea of Galilee, uh, but with, with the Emmaus Road disciples that afternoon after Easter morning. After Easter morning, he breaks bread with them. Uh, later, uh, when he, when he, when he when he's uh, behind when behind locked doors, when he appears, he asks for something to eat. He tell you, his spirit does not have flesh and bones. Remember, he demonstrates he's tangible. He's real. He's not some kind of apparition. And then later on, when they're at the Sea of Galilee, and, they, and Peter jumps in and swims and sees him and so forth, uh, that morning he's what? Cooking, uh, he has breakfast ready when they arrive. But he doesn't drink wine with them. He doesn't finish. He will not touch the fruit of the vine until we're all together, united with him. And uh, very interesting. That that's a very special closure that uh, will occur when we're all together with him. The fourth cup. But the Lord's table is also both commemorative and predictive. Okay, um, we're back in verse chapter 9, verse 15. We have another familiar thing introduced here that's uh, strange stuff, frankly. Strange stuff. And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle Namely, the tent of testimony. Back up a little bit. You recall, uh, all of us remember the the Mill movie, I think, of the Ten Commandments, which uh, in its way was an interesting piece of work. Um, The Mill, with whatever else was true, went to some expense to try to make it as accurate as he could using all the resources they could muster. So while it has its flaws, it still is an interesting piece of work. But you also recall it was there when... Uh, so in one thing they gra- graphically dramatized is the pillar of fire by day and the, and the, uh, the, pillar, the cloud by uh, day and the fire by night. And so that is introduced not here, but then. It was, the, it was this pillar that separated and held off the Egyptians, and it was also uh, uh, the, you know, uh, the visible, tangible manifestation of God's presence. That pillar of fire, or the cloud, um, is here then now tying itself, if you will, to the tabernacle itself. On the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud, that is, it's, that was familiar to them, because uh, covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of testimony. At evening there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. Cloud by day, fire by night, in other words. So it was always the cloud covered it by day, the appearance of fire by night, and when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed. And in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord they encamped. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. When the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and journeyed not. So it was, when the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, according to the commandment of the Lord, they abode in their tents, and according to the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. And so it was, when the cloud abode from evening unto the morning, that the cloud was taken up in the morning, that they journeyed. And whether it was by day or by night that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. And whether it were two days or a month or a year, that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle, remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. At the commandment of the Lord, they rested in their tents, and at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Rather dramatic kind of leadership to day by day see God's visible hand upon them. And that's going to become increasingly amazing to us as we move on, uh, as we get into chapters 10, 11, and so on, we start discovering as they move, they start murmuring. And as we, uh, as we uh, examine their record in the wilderness, it's pretty dismal. No matter what God does, it's not enough. He provides manna, and they get bored with the diet. So he gives them the largest quail hunt in history. Uh, you can do, you can convince yourself there were 20 billion quail, three feet off the ground being beat down. We get into that. With um, but, uh, but as we look at that, we can't help but be amazed 
that people who who um, have seen so such tangible involvement of the creator of the universe with them that would have uh, have um, this headstrong, stubborn, rebellious attitude. Um, in fact, I can remember some friends of ours who are not saved. Uh, again, making just reference to the famous DeMille movie, The Ten Commandments. When they saw that, uh, they were in, they were intrigued, and uh, uh, but they made the remark too. They could not. One of the, one of the reactions they had just to the story, the narrative, was how good because at the end, you know, of course they compress the history quite particularly near the end of the movie, where they have. Uh, 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 Edward G. Robinson, so the, the rebellion is shown there, and the earth breaks up and swallows them. You, you see that after all of that, after that dramatic um, intervention by God on their behalf with the plagues and the deliverance from Egypt, that in in no time at all they're ready to go back. You know, well, you brought us out of the desert to die, and we want, at least in Egypt we had to do. You know, you saw the, uh, a, a, at least a sort of a hint of that murmuring issue. Um, one of the reactions that uh, people have to that is that's incredible that a people that had been witnesses to this deliberate staging by God. You know, God made that very clear, that he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart to really show off. He really did, and he did. <laughs> and it was impressive. Uh, got everyone's attention. Um, and yet, in, in no time at all, they're, they're murmuring and so forth. And it was interesting, these friends were just saying how they could not could understand that people with that witness uh, behaving like that. It's interesting that you and I have vastly more tangible evidence than they did of God's intervention. We have the benefit of not only all of that history, but of Jesus Christ and his presence. And yet, are we any better? Don't we murmur? You know, I mean, all the things, as we go through the book of Numbers and we see these these turkeys (laughs) act this way, we're going to take pause because we're going to realize that we in our own way are are being modeled here, and that's why it's in here for our learning, because we're no better. And um, uh, so it's uh, we need to go carefully. Something else about this uh, this pillar and fire thing that disturbs me a little bit. It's interesting that God um, allows them to make no plans on their own. It's interesting that God doesn't give them a course plotted. Here's where we're going, guys. Three weeks from now, we're going to be over there. It's day by day leading. We got up in the morning, they looked outside, and the pillar's still over the tabernacle. We can sort of relax today. We're going to live. Whoops, the pillar's gone. Pack up, guys. We're going somewhere. Don't know where. Let's follow it. There it goes. So they move. They Several million people, you know, take down their tents and pack up their goods and the Kohathites and the Gershonites and the Marites do their thing with the tabernacle and the order of march and they sound the trumpet and the, you know, the camp of Judah moves out for, you know, the whole thing. Bear in mind, Moses was a military commander under Pharaoh. You know, he, the, the, the one thing about the, that uh, uh, was fair, apparently fairly accurate as far as the ancient references are concerned, Josephus and others, that uh, Moses uh, did have a period prior to Midian and so forth. He was trained as a as a leader. He was in, literally the uh, the heir apparent to the Egyptian command. So he was he was an able guy. Now what we're dealing with here is what the Lord instructed him. But you should also recognize that Moses didn't come to that task untrained. He had skills. So the whole this whole episode of several million people moving because the cloud's gone over the tabernacle, guys. It's over the hill there. Let's go. And, when, and they, as long as it led them, they moved. Then when it stopped, hey, unpack, set it up, you know, day by day. No plan, no ops order, no, uh, uh, you know, schedule. You know, a week from Tuesday we're going to be in Kadesh Barnea or something, you know. Um, they made no plans on their own. And, um, you know, it's Psalm, 30, Psalm 32, we might turn to Psalm 32 eight. There are lots of these. We'll just pick a, a few. I think it's the Psalm 32, 8. Uh, 
The psalm speaks in one voice through the first seven verses, but in verse 8, the, sh- the, the voice shifts. God is replying to David. But it's an interesting verse. It's one worth putting in your memory list if you're in that thing, that sort of thing. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. That's both the good news and the bad news, in a sense. The good news is God will lead us. God says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I believe that's written to you and I. God will instruct us and teach us in the way that we shall go. I will guide thee with mine eye. What makes me nervous is, he appears to choose most, more often than not to do exactly like he did in the book of Numbers, day by day, day by day. The one tough lesson that you and I have to relearn over and over and over again is that on the one hand, uh, salvation comes by a wholehearted, full, non-reservation commitment to Jesus Christ. And there is an event in your life when that happens. That's great. But there's another kind of a thing that that gets reconfirmed moment by moment, day by day. When we fail to do that, we stumble. And I'm not going to get into eternal security tonight, if I possibly can avoid it. But clearly, we have a moment-by-moment, day-by-day fellowship issue of responding to his leadership. And I think this pillar in Numbers, the pillar of fire by night or the cloud by day, should remind us that they, the Israelites, were led moment-by-moment. They had no master plan to follow. They knew that the ultimate goal was to be into the promised land. They could retreat to the, uh, to the promises God had given them, that they were destined for an inheritance. But there was no time schedule. They actually took 40 years to do a three-day journey, but that was their fault. That was their fault. It's also interesting to realize that God's um, objectives were achieved. I mean, they made it to the promised land. But it's also interesting that there wasn't a master plan, even in God's mind. He did it interactively with them. If they had been obedient, they would have gotten there 40 years earlier. You know, we're going to find out this whole business, you know, of the, the the 10 spies versus the two, you know. That's one time that majority shouldn't rule, you know. Um... The, the, the Joshua and Caleb who gave the good report, they get, they're the only two survivors that get to go in line. The rest is the whole generation has to turn over over the 40 years. It's the children that get to go in. 40 years of in the penalty box. The point is God's purposes are without compromise. He's going to get his people into the promised land. He promised them they'd make it. But he didn't tell them the timetable. Timetable could have been a couple of days. What is it? I think it's a three-day journey to Kadesh Barnea. They were there once and they blew it. So they wander for 38 years, whatever it is, you know, before they um, enter because uh, um, they blew it. So God chooses to accomplish his purposes through us, interactively with us. And he'll give you the easy way to do it or the hard way to do it. He'll work with you. If if you belong to Jesus Christ, he's going to shape and conform you ultimately into the image of Christ. And you can make it hard or easy. He'll play it either way. And uh, uh, most of us work very hard at it to go it the hard way. And uh, I remember I had, uh, I, I, I heard a prayer years ago that echoes in my mind. It's one of the most precious prayers I've ever heard. The context I first heard it was a time of grief. It was actually Wes Hardy, and he was praying for a couple. We were all together, a couple that had a very a, a, a event occurred that gave them a lot of grief. And as he prayed for them, he prayed a prayer that was so bizarre, I remembered it so vividly. Usually when someone is grieving, you would comfort, you think, you think of all kinds of things to pray for. His prayer was, Father, I pray that the lessons not be wasted. I was sitting there agreeing, looked up, peeked around, wondered what was that all about. And he probably knew a lot that I, about the situation I didn't know, but the point is I'll never, I've never forgotten that. What an interesting prayer. When we're confronted with trouble, a setback, grief, or whatever, what a fabulous prayer. 
Father, please don't let these lessons be wasted. Why? Because the Lord has a three-day journey or a 40-year journey. Take your choice. Wouldn't it be nice, you know, to accelerate the training a little bit and uh, not have to repeat the course over and over and over again? And uh, uh, wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it have been a different history for Israel, as we'll see as we get through the book of Numbers, if they would have been obedient, took about his word, done what he, what he suggested? I shouldn't say suggested. That's not the right word. I need a stronger word. Ten Commandments were not suggestions. Um, Our motto ought to be the will of God. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Always, everywhere, at all costs. That ought to be our motto. If only they would have learned that. The will, the, the conformity to the will of God. Nothing more, nothing else, else. Nothing, nothing more, nothing less. Nothing else. Always, everywhere, and at all costs. Hard to argue with, but very difficult to apply. Because we keep making plans on our own, and of course, in the pragmatics of day-to-day living, you'd have to. But can we? somehow learn to subordinate them to the way the Lord is leading. Okay, now we're in chapter 10. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver. Two trumpets of silver. Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. Two trumpets. These are katsotseras, as opposed to shofars. What that means is that they were long, flared trumpets, the classical kind of thing you often see in the movies in a, in a palace setting. You know, the, to announce, you always see the trumpeters. Well, long, straight uh, trumpets. In contrast to the shofar, which is the trumpet of the jubilee, a, uh, a coronet or a ram's horn, curved type of trumpet, uh, uh, and that's the shofar. Another phrase that's also synonymous with the, with the shofar, the jubilee horn, is the yobel. Different Hebrew words, different trumpets, different applications. These trumpets are going to be blown by the priests as a rallying call and to uh, act as a clarion in time of war and to act uh, to signal the advances. They blow it once for the tribe of the camp of Judah to move, twice for the next camp and so forth. We'll see. Verse 2. Make thee two trumpets of silver of a whole piece shalt thou make them that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And before the book of Numbers is over, we're going to talk a lot more about trumpets because there's different trumpets with different applications. And one of the great mysteries that we're not going to try to tackle tonight um, for a lot of reasons uh, is uh, to try to unravel the use of trumpets in at least four different, three or four different areas. One is the trump. Let's first of all understand the use of the trumpets in the book of Numbers. And then let's also understand the trumpets that were used by Joshua. And, let's, and all of that is aimed at trying to understand symbolically or whatever other way the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation. And then having done all of that, we would like to understand how does that relate to the trumpets in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. Right? And uh, it would be neat if I had a nice tidy answer for all of that. I have some views and things we'll share as we go. But uh, the one thing I would caution you to be careful of, there are different trumpets for different purposes, and also there will be trumpets in the millennium. Now, if that's the case, what do we mean by the last trump? It certainly is the last. It is not the last trumpet that's ever blown, because there's trumpets that are blown after the rapture. What do we mean by the last trump? I get that question a great deal. 
the suggestion I make to you, without wanting to get into it all tonight, is don't presume that the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation is the last trumpet. Some people try to make that link so that they can simplify charts and diagrams. Uh, the trouble is that the seventh trumpet in Revelation is not the last trumpet. It's the last of that series for that purpose. The trumpet you and I will hear at the rapture is the last trump we'll hear in this life. Okay, so is it the first, the third, the seventh of the seven, or is it any of those? Who knows? It's a complicated subject. And I, I'm not suggesting a, a specific answer. I'm suggesting be very cautious before you hang your hat on some theology that makes its case because of a presumption that the last trumpet uh, that, the, that Paul speaks of in his letters is equivalent to the seventh trumpet in Revelation. That's a huge leap around which you can fall into all kinds of errors. So be, care, be careful. So, uh, but we'll, let's go on here. If we can get through chapter 10. I think we can make it. Um, verse 3, And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow but one trumpet, then the princes, who are the heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. In other words, there are two ways of blowing it, whether you want everybody or just the leaders. See? When ye blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. That's the, Ju the camp of Judah and his brothers. Uh, when ye blow an alarm the second time, the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey, and they shall blow an alarm for their journeys. But when they, and incidentally, if you if that's all you read, you get the feeling that the east and north side never get off the ground. I mean, they never get going uh, because it only mentions you know the first blow, the 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 east side, the second one is on the uh, south side, and they never in the Septuagint version of the Book of Numbers they add for whatever reasons the the. Uh, east and north sides. There's four sectors, which is what you'd expect. But in this text, we don't have it. The Septuagint inserts that. And it certainly is logical because that's obviously what happened. But just as an aside. But when the congregation, verse 7, when the congregation is to be gathered together, ye shall blow, but ye shall not sound an alarm. Now we've had different ways, different styles of blowing the horn. When the sons of Aaron and priests shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. Oh, really? They shall be an ordinance forever, not just in the wilderness wanderings, not just in the conquest of Canaan under Joshua, but forever, which is kind of interesting, because we're going to be very interested in trumpets as we go forward in prophecy. And if you go, if ye go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. Gee, I hadn't occurred to me. I should do some research. I wonder what the Israeli army does today. I wonder if they use trumpets. Well, if they don't, they ought to reread Numbers 10, huh? I am sure they do, but I don't know that for a fact. And also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days and in the beginnings of your months, you shall blow with the trumpets of your burnt offerings and over your sacrifices of your peace offerings. And they shall be to you for a memorial before your God, for I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass in the 20th day of the second month in the second year when the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle of the testimony, and the children of Israel took their journeys out of the wilderness of Sinai. And the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. And they first took their journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. In the first place they went, the standard of the camp of the children of Judah, according to their armies. Over uh, its host was Nashon, the son of Abinadab. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Issachar was Nathaniel, the son of Zoar. And it goes right on through these names that I'll mispronounce. <laughs> um, oh, and then the tabernacle was taken down. The sons of Gershon and the sons of Merai set forward bearing the tabernacle. And that's, that's after the three tribes that make up the camp of Judah. Then comes Merai, Merai. Uh, the standard of the camp of Reuben set forward according to their enemies, uh, armies, and uh, over its host was Eliezer, the son of Shadir, and over the host of the tribe of the children of Simeon was uh, uh, Shalumiel, who was the son of <laughs> Zerushaddai, 
over the host of the tribe of the children of Gad was Elisaph, the son of De- Deuel. And then the Kohathites set forth. See, interspersed between the two camps are these families of the Levites bearing their 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 burdens. The Kohathites set forth bearing the sanctuary, and the others did set up the tabernacle for their coming. The standard of the camp, the children of Ephraim, set forward according to their armies, and over its host was Elishama, the son of uh, uh, Amihud. Uh, over the host of the tribe of the children of Manasseh was Gamaliel, the son of Pedazur, and that, over the host of the tribe of the children of Benjamin was uh, Abidan, the son of Gideoni. And uh, just like Israelis of Israel, we have Gideonites. But anyway, the standard of the camp of the children of Dan set forward, which was the rear guard of all the camps throughout their hosts, and over its uh, host was uh, Ahazer, the son of Amenashadai. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Asher was Pegiel, the son of Lachran. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Naphtali was Ahira, the son of Ethan. And thus were the journeys of the children of Israel according to their army they set forward. And Moses said unto Hobab, the son of Raguel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, We are journeying unto the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come thou with us. And we will do thee good, for the Lord hath spoken good con- concerning Israel. And he said unto him, I will not go, but I will depart to mine own land and to my kindred. And he said, Leave us not, I pray thee. For as much as thou knowest how we are to encamp in the wilderness, and thou mayest be to us instead of eyes. And it shall be, if thou go with us, yea, it shall be that what goodness the Lord shall do unto us, the same will we do unto thee. And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days' journey. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day and when they went out and they when they went out of the camp. And it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto thy men, to the many thousands of Israel. Okay. Now, in um, chapter 11, we'll start the murmuring. And um, we start this uh, sad tale. And we have in chapter 11 the, uh, this, uh, these complaints and, and uh, the uh, establishment of a second, a second tier of command, the 70 elders to help Moses, the burdens that he has. And uh, we'll also have the largest quail hunt in history. And uh, and uh, it's unbelievable. You get chapter fourteen. Would God that we had died in in uh, in the land of Egypt. I mean, that's that's this unbelievable, unbelievable uh, posture on these people's part. Um, I don't think we'll start. We'll, we'll we'll say that for the next time we meet. Um, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Now we're gonna we're gonna skip next Monday night next two Mondays, you're off the hook. But I sure look forward to seeing you. Um, what would that be? Is that the first the, the first Monday in March? In effect, the sixth of March, sixth of March, and um, we we'll we we'll gather then. We're gonna learn a lot from the wandering wanderings of Israel in the wilderness. Because you and I tragically spend too much time in the wilderness ourselves, rather than cross over and and uh, treat it to the. You know, as we go through numbers, there's times that I wish we were in the Book of Joshua. That's sort of more exciting. We're, but uh, there's going to be some very, very dramatic lessons that the Lord Himself makes reference to as we go forward. So let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Father, we praise you that we have your leadership in our lives available to us. Father, we would just ask you through the power of your Holy Spirit to just increase our sensitivity to your will in our lives that we indeed might be more responsive to the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. That you might indeed, as you led Israel, lead us clearly and unequivocally, day by day, moment by moment, on that path that you would have us trod. We ask these things, Father, that we might be more responsive to your will, that we might be more pleasing in thy sight. 
We would ask you, Father, to help us grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom, in whose name we proclaim all these things. Amen.